open the window. Don't start the presentation. Simply share what you see that the presentation is, and then you go to the presentation and you say start presenting. How about this, guys? Is this showing now? Yeah, but that can can be that uh, it's not working on your computer. Because yes, no, no, it's, it's yeah. okay. It's okay. It's okay. working. Fine. Yeah. And do you guys okay. still really see fine. me as well? Yes. At the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Excuse I me. I think it's okay. Then. Excuse okay. me. Okay. We're starting in one minute. And uh, how do I stop sharing? Huh? It's uh, Pause. and then you hover stop at the bottom. Hover over it. Stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, less Sorry. than one minute uh, for, for start. It's almost uh, time. Okay. Ready. Good morning and welcome to all participants. I am Giovanni Felici, Scientific Officer at ERCEA, and I am the organizer of this session together with Michael Lee and the Bengochea. The title of the session is The Future of Health Data Management, Latest Research on Data Processing and Energy Efficient Data Hosting. Indeed, a very ambitious topic. In the context of the Digitalization Hub, we have put together two scientists that interact to cover a very important problem for the future of citizens. How new methods can impact on their health by integrating data and medicine, and how new technologies can guarantee that the increasing demand of computational power generated also by these new applications can be efficiently met. Inter interestingly, we will see how well organized computer scientists are. On the one hand, some of them develop methods that improve citizens' health and in doing so generate new computational needs. On the other hand, others develop methods that improve the efficiency of computing centers and make them able to meet the just generated demand. Indeed, a great teamwork. Both our speakers are laureate ERC grantees. Natasha Pretzu, who will talk about integrative computational network biology, received an ERC starting grant in 2011 and an ERC consolidator grant in 2017. David Atian Salonso is the principal investigator of a consolidator grant awarded in 2016. After their talks, that will last approximately 15 minutes each, we will have time to interact with the speakers. This can be done by the chat, where you can post comments and contribution, or with the questions and answers that you find on the right of your screen, where, of course, you can post questions. But there, on the question and answers, you can also vote for the questions of other participants to increase their chance to be selected for the discussion. So remember, the chat is for comments and contribution, and the question and answer is for specific questions that can be voted before they're posed to the speakers. The floor now goes to Natasha. Professor Presso is group leader of life science, integrative computational network biology at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center in Spain. Her talk, titled Data for Health, Enabling Data Integrated Medicine, will cover many aspects related with her funding ERC grant called Icon Bio. Natasha, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Giovanni. Uh, I will now start uh, sharing my screen. Uh, just let me do that to see. And if you could please confirm that you see uh, my screen. 
Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me. It's a great honor to be here. I will present about 20 years of my academic work that currently we are in the process of commercializing. And in particular, we develop AI and data analytics software for de-risking portfolio assets in pharmaceutical and biotech companies. As uh, Giovanni said, I'm in Barcelona Supercomputing Center, also ICREA, and I'm also a full professor of computer science at University College London, one of the world's top ranked institution. Why do we need this software for de-risking portfolio assets? We've seen that technological advances in experimental biology have yielded an astounding harvest of various molecular and clinical data. This data growth was guided by empirical reductionism, striving to dissect a biological entity into its constituent parts to better understand it. However, even Charles Darwin in his Origins of Species wrote that biology is a tangled bank with all of its elements interconnected. At the same time, in Germany, pioneering observation of Dr. Firchhoff uh, that all diseases co uh, are caused by changes in normal cell cells forever changed the way we practice medicine. This data growth about the cell has made us hit the wall of biocomplexity. And the time has come to replace this mostly reductionist molecular perspective that dominated the 20th century with a new and a holistic view of the living world that's required to explain biological and medical phenomena and biology's in, uh, innate complexity. Why this replacement? This is because we know that cells are not just loosely coupled arrangements of quasi-independent molecules but highly intricately and precisely integrated networks of entities and interactions within the cell and with the environment. All of these data types complement each other, and they're like a different pair of glasses that we put on to look at the same thing at the living cell. And this is why they seek joint modeling and mining with the foremost challenge being how to resynthesize biology how to put all of its elements back into their complex dynamic environments and connect them all within a unified framework uh, and reformulate biological paradigms within the nonlinear world. This requires establishing a perspective and framework not only for one problem, but for biology and medicine in general. And we have many challenges mostly falling into two categories, computational and data-driven. The computational ones come from our problems being so-called computationally hard or computationally intractable. This means that we can probably not solve them exactly, even given all the time of the universe and all the compute power of the world on large data that we have. And this is why our only way to, to, to solve them is to develop sophisticated methods, but that are carefully tuned to extract new knowledge only from particular data. One such problem seems simple, but it's computationally intractable, and that is of comparing or aligning large network data. But even when we design these approximate methods for extracting new information out of each of these different qualitatively different kinds of data, whether they're networks of simultaneous expressions or co-expressions of genes or binding of proteins in the cell or metabolic interactions, et cetera, et cetera. The question is how to fuse them, integrate them within the same framework to see what they collectively tell us and also how to do that in a patient-centric way to better human lives and health care. The other challenge comes from data. Not only that they are large and complex, but they also complement each other. And this means the following. This is an example of what I mean. We have three different kinds of data. Protein bindings in the cell, simultaneous expressions of pairs of genes in the cell, and so-called genetic interactions. And even though these three data types in human overlap in over 3,000 genes, they have only one shared pair or one shared interaction. This is why most of the current data fusion and data integration simply fail because there is no interaction. 
And my vision is to bridge this gap by developing a mathematically principled framework for integration of all network data that will marry biomedical problems and data with algorithms from all sorts of computational sciences, including machine learning, optimization, network science, algebraic topology, etc. And we have to do all this within high performance computing platforms because of the above mentioned computational intractability of these problems. So I propose modeling and computational advances that will link the medicines, reductionist past, with its holistic future, and enable displacement of the dominant molecular representation of biology by a new integrative paradigm that is deeper, more comprehensive, and inspiring. And I would also like to do effective transfer this of this science to industry so that all could benefit from it. And I believe the only way to do it or the best way is via a startup. Um, and the startup will do uh, uh, software for de-risking portfolio assets in farm and biotech companies. And I will illustrate this on three examples of what this new software can do. This is all part of the above mentioned ERC consolidator grant. And I will do this with the help of the seed funding ERC proof of concept grant that I was just awarded and that just started earlier this month. And I acknowledge also ERC's uh, consolidator grant that enabled my transfer from America to the EU a while ago. Let me illustrate the methodology. We have cancer tissue and healthy tissue in human. We have three different kinds of data, co-expressions of genes in the tissue, protein physical bindings, and genetic interactions. As I said, these data types complement each other. We want to fuse them within the mathematically principled framework. Then we have Basically, we make these new integrated cells coming from all data types together. We call them integrated cells or I cells. And then we want to compare these I cells between cancer and healthy tissues. That comparison of networks, we just said it's computationally intractable. And this is why a while ago I developed so called graphlets. I introduced them back in 2004 when I was in Canada. Um, and now they've become highly cited and used in many fields to build network and node comparison methods. So we use these graphlets to compare across eye cells of cancer and healthy tissues to identify new cancer genes for which we can propose drugs either to repurpose or construct new drugs to fix these broken genes or their protein products. An illustration of how the method works. We have three different kinds of data illustrated by color by colors here red blue and green the interactions between genes they're represented in matrices on x and y axis are genes and in these matrices between genes is the value of their interactions we decompose these these three matrices simultaneously into lower dimensional matrices and we also share this matrix factor g and we do this by minimizing this objective function which is computationally intractable why we do it anyways and then from these matrices g we construct these new networks that we call integrated cells and in these integrated cells, we unveil new biological information that emerges from this fusion of the data. And you can see this on this graph in this bar chart, in these bar charts, where eye cells that are pink have more functional information than any of the constituent data types in isolation. Okay. Now. I will demonstrate this on three examples. The first one is in cancer. And what this new software can do, and the software is to de-risk portfolio assets in pharma and, uh, in, and biotech companies. Right now, it's demonstrated academically on hundreds of patients, but we need to scale it up industry to thousands and hundreds of thousands, and hopefully millions of patients. And this is why we are building this startup to solve these technical issues. But not only that, we need to optimize data science operations in these companies, free up resources to save costs at many levels. 
So we took four most prevalent cancers in human, breast, prostate, lung, and colorectal. We compared eye cells of these cancers and normals and found the most rewired genes in cancer. 20 top most rewired in these four cancers. Out of those 80, 63 were unique. And also, almost all of them we managed to validate either through literature curation or our biological experiments where we knocked down these particular genes in cancer cell lines and found and then observed these uh, uh, cells under the microscope whether they grow less after we knock down these genes or more. So we validated many of them through our knockdown experiments in cancer cell lines and also in retrospective analysis of patient data in so-called survivals of patients, survival curves. We observed that patients with mutations in these 63 genes have different survivals than the patients without these mutations. And this again demonstrates that this methodology works. And we could have not found these in any of the constituent data types alone. This emerges only from data fusion. Then we went pen cancer for 20 cancers in total. And we found, for instance, this top hit, this new gene, NUDT8, for which it was not known that it does anything in cancer before, but we found that mutations in patients of a different kinds of cancers of this particular gen, gene cause different survival of these patients. The next example is for rare diseases. These diseases are peculiar. We cannot cure them properly because we cannot understand them because they're rare. We don't have enough uh, patients to make statistical inferences. And this is why we do this data fusion of all available data to boost the signal. This example is a rare form of thrombophilia that happens only in northern Italy, the Balkans, and the Far East. We have only two families, two brothers, one diseased and one healthy, and the daughter of the healthy brother who is diseased, and two diseased sisters. When we do the fusion, for the first time, we find these clusters of mutated genes that are mutated only in diseased women and this another cluster of mutated genes that is specific to the to the healthy brother and we are currently in the process of validating these with our collaborators the third example is personalizing treatment that we apply to cancer but also to covid this is an illustration that this method is explainable AI, providing mechanistic explanations. We have three types of data. One is patients. We have their mutations of their genes. The second data type is genes. We have various interactions on these genes, whether they're metabolic, protein interactions, etc. We have drugs and their chemical similarities. We, have, we know which drugs bind to which gene products, which proteins, and we know which patients were treated or could be treated by particular drugs. Again, we optimize an, these objective functions through lower dimensional matrices and we share matrix factors to uh, uh, obtain the fusion of the data. And from this same formula, we read all three tasks of precision medicine, stratification of patients into different groups that should be treated differently, even though these are all ovarian cancer patients of one type. We predict new genes that drive progression of cancer, and we repurpose drugs and their dosages and combinations to these particular cancer groups. This methodology is very versatile, that it, it can encompass all available data, but each time you pose it, it corresponds to different computationally intractable problem for which we have to propose objective function, optimization solver, proof convergence, correctness, and optimization is slow. That is why we have to use high performance computing. And this is why we need to solve the technical issues via a startup. We did analysis of, the, of thousands of COVID patients for which we have gene expressions in the lungs. And these papers of ours will appear later this year. To conclude, Advances will come from holistically mining all available data, for which we need conceptual paradigm shifts such as the eye cell, also the methodological ones such as new mathematical formalisms and algorithms to extract new information from these formalisms. However, computational issues will remain stemming from computational intractability, and this is why education is key 
and we need to train embedded data science, scientists who will uh, specifically be trained to uh, resolve problems for specific areas. And to that end, I published this textbook by Cambridge University Press last year. We need to take our results strictly out of the academic settings, and I believe that we are a startup, the Geneta, to scale out and productize iCells. I thank the proof of concept grant from ERC. Also, ERC was instrumental to my transition from the USA to the EU, awarding me uh, starting and consolidator grants. And I'm very saddened to see the budget cuts to ERC that are not only unfortunate, but could be detrimental, fatal to the, uh, to the EU economy. So the key is to sustain and, if possible, accelerate this funding and enable more funding for transfer of technology out of academia. Because right now, other than the, uh, with these proof of concept grants, we only have SME instruments uh, that are now called EIC Accelerator. I'd like to acknowledge various funding organizations from the EU, from the US, from Canada, also private companies, smaller uh, uh, national organizations, as well as my group, without whom none of this would have been possible, and also the learned societies that acknowledge my work. And I thank you all for your attention. And I will stop sharing my screen now. Very good. Thanks a lot, Natasha. This is, was a beautiful speech. We couldn't agree less uh, more with the last considerations about the EU budget, of course. But let's proceed. Um, uh, participants know that uh, if they have uh, questions, and I'm, I'm sure they do, uh, we'll have time for asking things to Natasha and David at the end of the session after David's presentation. So now, the second speaker I was saying is David Alonso. David is head of the Embedded System Laboratory at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology of Lausanne in Switzerland. And his talk is uh, Designing Energy Minimal Computing Systems, Follow the Brain. And in this case, we will enjoy some of the results funded by the ERC grant Compute Sapien. David, please take the floor. Thank you, Thank you Giovanni. So let me share the screen as well. Okay, so do you see the slides finally? Uh, not yet, if you ask me. It's coming. coming now. Yeah, we have to go on the screen, little tab on the left top. But we yeah. will see it. And okay, let me see. let's go. Perfect. So let's go. So thank you very much for the introduction and the opportunity to be here. It's my pleasure to discuss a complementary topic to Natasha, which is uh, related to the infrastructure that you need to process. Um, all the uh, data that is coming actually from this type of brain testing medical applications. And I would like to propose a quite provocative title, which is the idea of following the brain. What does it mean following the brain? It means basically that we need to really rethink drastically how we are designing our computing systems. And I believe the European Union, uh, and in particular the scientists with the support of the European Commission, have a great opportunity to do that. And I will try to illustrate that in the talk today. So the first point is clearly what has been shown that you have a dramatic um, growth in the uh, in the way that actually you have the uh, the uh, requirements of the data centers to process the data. You see that the data is growing. Natasha has shown that you need to have data to create this type of applications, and indeed the projection shows that there's, a, there's an exponential growth that is going to happen in the next years to be able to solve problems like gene sequencing, pandemics, like what we have, drug simulations, molecular dynamics, many different elements like that that really require very powerful data centers. A very good example that I wanted to share with you was the development of the uh, CAFBIS project, which was a project that we developed in my laboratory with the help of a few other international institutions, where the idea was that we could try to, uh, or we're trying to see if we could pre-screen COVID-19 patients based on the calf sound. And the reason is because the World Health Organization, as soon as the whole process started, 
show that actually two thirds of the patients that have COVID have a very particular dry cough. So we did, thanks to the support of the embedded systems that we developed in my lab, plus uh, data centers all around the world, we created a web app for doctors, as well as a web app for users, where we could actually target both certified data collection and crowdsourcing data collection from people that were suffering from cough, uh, from cough symptoms with COVID. And this was uh, possible thanks to the support of the data center and highlighting all the different elements that we needed there. We needed the data center to be 24 hour a day available to be able to collect the data. We needed to be able to use the, the computational resources of the data center to process the data and create also algorithms that we could then provide for patients in the native app so that they can actually test and use and provide us feedback so that we could actually improve it further. Overall, what we get with this type of exercise, it's a really interesting result, which shows that first people are willing to help all over the world. So we were able to collect more than 19,000 recordings, including 15, hospi 15 hospitals collaborating with us in more than 62 countries. Uh, there we were able to really compare the way that actually people suffer from COVID and the particular uh, specificities of the caffeine in the different regions. And more importantly, because we have all this infrastructure, we can actually share now the results and the database that we have so that people from the uh, medical research community can keep fighting COVID. And we can actually do that thanks to the support of the data centers that are worldwide. And now it's integrated in the big, in this big data. So clearly there's a clear benefit of having some very strong and powerful uh, resource for data processing in Europe. And indeed, what you can see in the map, the largest part of the data that we were able to collect and process successfully was coming from people in Europe. So we were able to create the analysis and so on things to that. Now, if we look at the situation of data centers, how they are designed, we can clearly see that there's growing the demand, but there uh, the efficiency on the computing side is not at the level it should be, considering how many uh, millions we are spending on them. So you see here an example from the US. You can see that it really can uh, consume a significant amount of energy. Indeed, if we calculate what is the amount of energy being used even today at the level of data centers, it can actually cover almost 50 million homes, which is significant amount. You can see also the maintenance costs. You see that these large data centers or mega data centers can consume, um, can cost up to $3 billion uh, when you see the big companies in the US. And what is even more scary is that these data centers electricity consumption is going to keep growing to reach levels that actually are almost at the, uh, covering 8% of the whole worldwide electricity by 2030. So what we need to actually do is to find ways to really optimize the data centers so that the system is correctly uh, used and you don't really waste energy because if you need to have 8% of the energy used, you need to better use it well. Now, if we look at data centers, how they are uh, used, this is even more scary because you see that they always, the, the data centers are always on. This is one of the key features of, of this particular architecture that we have today for data centers that you want to make sure that no matter what happens, you can always respond. But the reality, if you look at uh, examples of very big companies that are having these large data centers in operation, these 24 hour a day, you see that no matter which day or which moment of the day, typically the utilization is around 60%. Very often it's even below 60%. Even in these very big companies with a lot of customers and what they try to do. And in the medical domain, it's even more extreme that they are really underutilized. So, if you try to understand where is the energy going through, uh, you see that it's even more scary because from the whole energy consumption in the data center, almost 38%, as you see in the graph, in the state of the data centers, which is what is, is shown as green, but for me, it's actually the red part. Actually, almost 30 to 40% is wasted because it's just in the cooling of the data center, basically means you have the computing and the memory resources used or trying to be used fully, with a full capacity, but in reality, you're not using them. So basically you're wasting this energy. And the only way that you find to the companies to keep this paradigm is either go for very dramatic or extreme situations. Like this is an example. Microsoft is starting to put these data centers under the water, but really under the water to minimize the schooling uh, energy, 
or you try to design them in a different way. And this is the idea of the project Compus Sapien and some other projects I've been doing in the European Commission since uh, FP7. We were trying to analyze uh, in my team what was the efficiency of the computing side for these data centers and understand specifically their inefficiency. So if we try to do this exercise, you can see that um, in the end data centers could be analyzed as very efficient computing architectures or computing systems. And you look at the computing density of what you can produce today with all the many years, almost 50 years of progression of our semiconductor electronics. And you see that the computing efficiency is still pretty far from what you reach in biological systems or biological brains. No matter what we say, even monkeys, mouses, a mouse or a mice can actually reach three orders of magnitude better in efficiency than what we can do today with our uh, very sophisticated and complex computing systems. They can reach orders of one giga operations per milliwatt, whereas we are very far from reaching that in, in, uh, in our computing data centers. The reason for that is that there are fundamental differences in the way that these data centers are designed with respect to the way that brains, and I'm putting here the human brain just to make it uh, clear, not the mice, so that we don't get really uh, offended with that, is actually operating. And there are three fundamental differences. The first one is that we, we, our brain, do not waste energy. The point is that when you don't really use it, the system is switched off and you really have zero energy computation overhead in that case. Whereas in our case, as we see, we have the data centers fully active all the time, no matter what it, what it comes. So the idea is that we need to really learn to self-adapt the utilization. And if you don't use data centers, you don't have to really have them utilized. Second one, you have power and computing. So power and computing power or cooling energy, both integrated. What does it mean? Today, you have the power supply going through electrical means, wires, whereas the cooling is typically done either through the air, through fans, or you have liquids or water that is typically poured on top of the, on the racks and so on to try to cool them down. So in the brain, this is both integrated. Through what? Through the, through the veins. You have the blood that is actually providing the power to the different um, cells and synapses. And you have as well, the cooling part that is actually at the same time being used. Finally, which is also very important for data centers, Memory and logic is integrated in the brain. What does it mean? It means you don't have one subsystem for storage of the data, another part where you have to transfer the data to compute it, which is what you have today. You have your memory and your hard disk that you actually have the data stored. Whenever you want to compute, you have to send it all the way to the computing processor, and that's actually going to cost you a lot of energy. So based on these inefficiencies, we, I got the idea of uh, creating a completely new many core architecture for the big data era, which is the foundations of the of the project Compus Sapien, the ERC consolidated program that I created, where the idea is to really try to uh, mimic as much as possible the architectural concepts that are very disruptive in the brain with respect to what we do in computing systems. And for that, if you look at, let's start. If we look at the brain, this is how the brain works, to see that it is really true that it serves at us. So you can see here that the activity comes, but the brain is mostly idle. Only you trigger uh, peaks when you really see very high activity or something that really matters. And if we do that, automatically we can make sure that during the rest of the time, the system is just receiving data, but not reaching the point to be analyzed or, or considered, and you don't have to do that. So we have tried to do that by having a new monitoring infrastructure that is based on IoT sensors that we can use to monitor many different magnitudes in the data center at the really level of the individual processing units in that are running in the data center as well as the storage racks with that which is what i call an internet of things solution because these are tiny sensors that are powered up by with supercapacitors that uh, can really run forever you don't need to even change the batteries because they are connected to the wires or the uh, or the servers and they suck a little bit of energy which is negligible and it can actually be used to monitor the the whole data center then you can actually create power and temperature monitoring tools that we have done, which is PMSM, is one of the tools that we actually created in this project. Um, uh, and once we have the whole uh, system done, you can start running uh, pretty sophisticated and well-tuned machine learning algorithms to make the runtime management. 
precisely like the brain does, that considering the amount of data that you are having used and so on, you can automatically control and try to make sure that you don't use more servers than what you actually need. Now, this whole project was initially done in an academic environment. We managed to convince one of the largest data center providers in Switzerland, as you can imagine that these are banks. So we talked to uh, Credit Suisse, and Credit Suisse agreed to try out our solution in their data centers. After two years of exercising, trying to uh, monitor and correctly tune the algorithms, we managed to reach savings of up to 50%. 50% is basically providing double amount of power for houses in Europe. Basically means that instead of 50 million houses that we can actually use with the energy of the data center, you could have 100, 100 million, and actually you reduce the power for uh, by half of the data center. So there's a very big potential here. The interesting thing is that even though we did the whole project in Europe with a European company, because still Credit Suisse is based in Switzerland in the end, turns out that the main or largest interest for this type of products which I think have a large relevance worldwide, was only for US. So in fact, the one that came uh, to discuss and in the end license the whole ecosystem that we made for these monitoring and data centers was a very large US company. And they are using it internally to optimize the energy that they have. But they still believe there's a lot of potential for European companies and even startups to really create these type of systems to really help improving the energy efficiency of data centers. Now, if we look more carefully at the architecture, like I said, there are two additional inefficiencies. The second one is power and cooling that has to be integrated. What can we do there? So the first one that we need to do is analyze how the system is being used. So you need to create on-chip microchannels that can actually combine the power delivery and the efficient cooling. Instead of making it through two million mediums, electric wires and liquid, we can actually make everything integrated like the brain in a single system, which is a power delivery network with microfluidic fuel cells, where you actually have the water, and in the water you dilute the fuel and oxidants, as if it was kind of a battery. You can think of it as a battery. The benefit of that is that the system is traversing the uh, power and the computing system, and whenever it heats up, it reacts and generates power. It generates power for free, and you can feed it back to the actual computing architecture. So when you're heating up, instead of just having to waste energy cooling the system, this cooling power is actually used to improve the efficiency of the system. And the warmer you are, the better it be worse. So what turns out is that with this approach, in one of the work packages of CompuSapping, we're able to recover 30% of the total energy of the system. So we are not only spending energy on cooling, but we are recovering a significant part of the energy in cooling. And I think this technology can really improve much further. Finally, we have the problem of memory and logic uh, being completely coupled. So you store on one side the, the data in a, in, a, in, a, in a storage rack, like what you see in off chip memories, and then you have to bring it back to the computing side. As a result, what happens is in many applications, machine learning for the, the medical processing and so on, a significant amount of the of the time, almost 90%, the processor is idle and waiting for memory. So you are also understanding now the reasons why the utilization is so low because you have to bring data all the time from memory. Now, the way to solve that is to do like what the brain does. If you think about the brain, the brain is not planar, like our chips or data centers. It's really 3D integrated, where the memory and the storage is really clustered together. So thanks to this new cooling technology, what we can do now is create a 3D architecture, because we have enough cooling capacity, thanks to these new microfluidic fuel cells, to cool down the system. And you get automatically 10 times the energy efficiency that you will have in current servers. Plus, on top of that, because we can have this very fine grain integration, you can start thinking of a specialization, like the brain does. Instead of having big processors, like we have today in servers, you can start thinking of heterogeneous architectures, where you have processors of different types, you can have big processors, small processors, and this is a new trend that is coming up and showing that you have almost 10 times energy efficiency by specializing the architectures that you have behind. And you can think of even having here open hardware, like the RISC V initiative that recently moved from the US to Europe because they don't let them work with Chinese companies, which is completely unfair if you think that it's open hardware. So here we have again an opportunity in Europe to really be the drivers of this open hardware innovation and computing architectures and be able to create architectures that they can efficiently 
execute different types of uh, medical applications for big data and create custom products that can be actually uh, really commercialized and that the expertise really comes from Europe. It's not something that we have to subcontract to any US company or Asian company. Now, the last thing I wanted to show you is just a, a prototype of the first uh, system that we have built in CompuSapien. So after uh, roughly three years, so you see here the, our first 3D integrated multi-layer cooling uh, many core chips where you have five layers of different processors. You have the micro channels running and you see here uh, these uh, little pipes or micro pipes that actually are uh, bringing the, the water with the uh, FCAs, the microfluidic cells inside. And what you can see, you can see that you can reach a very stable flat temperature of 52 degrees. The system works very well, 52 degrees all the time makes the energy efficiency of the FCAs reach its peak. And actually you can make, like I said, almost 30% of the energy back. So the conclusion that I wanted you to get from this is that I hope you realize that we are entering into a phase where big data, as uh, Natasha explained, is really fundamental in healthcare. It can actually bring a lot of benefit for society and Europe but data centers are very ineffective for doing that because they were never designed with efficiency in mind. And as a result, we really need to change how we design them. And there, I think Europe has a, a very big opportunity to really change the leadership that is happening in this world, which right now is clearly based uh, in US and it's actually moving towards Asia, but skipping Europe, where actually I think we should be actually a key part of it. And CompuSapping is an example. I have tried to show you that there are big inefficiencies that we can really uh, solve thanks to the use of um, our expertise and knowledge to both use or create new open hardware heterogeneous architectures, which can give you 100 times better energy efficiency than current servers. And if you really create methodologies to uh, adapt the management of servers, you can actually save almost half of the energy today. And I'm convinced we can do even better than that if we keep doing this in the future. With this, I conclude. Thank you very much for the uh, for the opportunity to present. Thank you very much, uh, Natasha and David, for your very interesting presentations. I, I am monitoring the questions from the audience. We didn't have still questions, but I have one for both of you. Uh, it's uh, partially you re responded it in a way, but I would like to have a more structured uh, answer to. You know, uh, to it, you have uh, we have in the audience people from coming from policy, policy makers, also people coming from uh, companies as well uh, from Europe uh, that are working in innovation aspects and so on. So you showed us very different aspects of uh, uh, of, of all the whole uh, problematic of the use of data and the hosting of data for health. Uh, what do you think that would be the most uh, pressing? Uh, aspects for policy making in the near future from your perspective as experts and also um, for opportunities for commercialization for innovation that we could maybe work more uh, from our uh, from our side uh, natasha can you start with that yes uh, thank you for that question it's a, it's a very good question how do we take the lead in here um, i think uh, we need to look at Basically, we need to find our own European way, but we need to look at those that already do it well. And in my view, because I've seen many systems, Canadian, American, and now European, um, it is through allowing the top science to flourish by enabling the key people, the top people to develop fully their teams and also bringing enough money through various instruments to enable them to commercialize this and not only the money but the infrastructure that they need meaning the administrative support and also to minimize the bureaucracy that they have to go through because usually these people that they are brilliant scientists but they might not be good at solving the administrative issues I think this is something that Europe needs to work on to take the lead. So uh, basically to, to enable this transfer of key top research into industry, via, usually via startups. Okay, thank you. And David? Uh, yes, so I will, uh, I'm going to actually, I fully agree with the remarks of Natasha. Let me take maybe a different angle. If we are looking at the, how we could do it from a global perspective, uh, from a um, policy viewpoint. So. As I show, I think we have a, in the area of data centers and computing systems, 
it's obvious that we are not going to be right now at this point starting to be the leaders in manufacturing. This is something that is actually not worth it, and I think it's going to go nowhere. On the other hand, as I try to show, we have very interesting concepts and really new things and opportunities in the area of design. So you think about designing of and, and finding new ways of creating disruptive computer architectures. I can think of it a little bit like what happened the iPhone, and you think designing California manufacturing Asia. So here's the same thing. I think. We have an opportunity to really create the designs of these new architectures in Europe. And I think there, there is a bit of a gap between what we can propose, like what I'm showing here of very interesting results and so on, and how much the industry can actually follow up. Very often because they don't have resources, they are very much uh, stuck in a two, three year time frame, and you cannot do that. It was interesting, not to say shocking for me, the two examples I tried to show, and I think it's a hint where I can see that the policymakers making an effort here is one, when I, we have done the effort of creating with uh, several projects of the European Commission, a whole framework, including the ERC, a whole setup where we have the monitoring and the policy to manage data centers. It took me hell of an effort to find somebody that wanted to use it. I'm actually having the whole technology done. I only have, want to have a customer. And it took me forever to do that. And actually we have to rely on a banking, Swiss banking industry to try out an IT solution, which actually can be used in any manufacturing fabric or system. So I think there, there's got to be an effort on creating programs where we really try to link together the key scientists. And Natasha said that we don't have maybe experience how to do the industrialization, but with people that can help us and really say, okay, look, these are the constraints that you have in the real world. And I think there, there needs to be a big effort on trying to align both the top end says that we need to really have the funding to do that, but also you need to have in the end a larger uh, proof of concept grants that can actually help us to do that. And the second one is, is indeed the startups. If we have an idea, we have tested all this and so on, we were trying to find who will help us to commercialize or actually then get the license uh, to really give them the, the results. It was extremely hard not to say impossible in the end to get a European company to do so. In the end, we, may, we finish giving, I would not say the results, because still we have a license that is non-exclusive, but we gave the first big push of commercializing this technology and making the biggest plus on the market to an American company. I find it shocking. I mean, we have spent the effort, we have all top scientists in Europe, and then suddenly, when you have to find a way to really try out this, there were all types of uh, excuses and arguments from the from the company saying, well, it's a very long time frame because it's five years round the road. We don't have resources for that. If something was wrong, so I think we have to change the mindset. And I think it starts from the politicians that we need to really find out that these are either we do it now or in five years from now we will be out of the game again. And I think one example is this: like what they mentioned, the the fact that the Open Hardware Initiative for Computing RIS Five has moved from from uh, the US to Europe. And we can be the drivers now to create these new architectures. And that will be actually based in Europe and everybody will have to buy European computing systems if we really design them now. If we wait five years, forget about it. It's going to happen somewhere else. And I think this is something okay. that we need to change. Okay. I I know that there are people in the audience that uh, are also representative from industry. So maybe we can support that on that links and hopefully- I will be happy to talk to them and give them my, my thoughts. That was also part of the of the idea of the of the session to have that. Uh, we have uh, one question. Uh, it's the only con the one that came from the audience, so I, I will just ask this, and uh, we will need to conclude the session with that. Uh, how can the EU promote data usage in a way that provides knowledge for new healthcare standards? Uh, it's referring to the hospitals have huge amount of health data just stored in servers, which which structure is owned by U U.S. companies. Um, so, do you want me to start, or uh, Natasha will start? So, how do you want us to do? Maybe okay. Natasha, because it's data usage. Data usage. Okay. Yeah, I mean, currently there are the big, uh, big burdens, uh, big administrative problems about the data uh, being in the U.S., bringing them into the EU. Um, I think the current solutions are probably not uh, very effective because what is done is 
supposedly we take a toy example, develop our methods on it, and then port it behind the firewall where some of their technicians are going to run it. This is not how it works. Because as I said, these are computationally intractable problems for which, for which we can only find efficient solutions on particular data. And if we don't have those data, there is no efficient solution. We cannot be working with anonymized, fully randomized data uh, to, to extract any information. This is something for policymakers to see how to do it properly. This is done by these distributed uh, uh, data centers now. Uh, where only the local copy is there, but of the real data that doesn't go anywhere uh, outside of these hospitals. I think we need these federated uh, uh, data storages and machine learning. I, I yeah. Think this is, yeah. This is if, I, if I can complement maybe one of the big burdens that we have seen in, uh, in a number of European projects I have been working on with uh, other partners from different universities and actually different uh, countries, we see that even the standards of sharing the data between countries in Europe is different. So there is a very big burden here on how to do these federated data centers and so on, because every hospital is very much afraid of sharing the data outside their own local territory. Because if you, if it goes from Germany to to Spain or to Italy or vice versa, then there's going to be a pretty much high uh, liability concern that they're going to have. So in the end, what you finish is either we create new methodologies to share the data while keeping local data there, but somehow to do it, or really it has to be done at the policy making level to really understanding that we are one, no matter which country you are, and you really have to create common policies of how to share this data, and specifically for um, analyzing multiple sources of data that you cannot have it scattered. Otherwise, you will have always tiny pieces of data that it will not be able to be used to create big diagnosis. One of the interesting things that happened, and I was going to give the example of the CAFP project that uh, I presented. We have 19,000 samples and 15 hospitals actually sharing the data. In the end, the, we finished collecting all the data in Switzerland, and we have to promise all of them that the data will stay in Switzerland, and then we have managed to clear out and sanitize the whole thing so that no data whatsoever is visible from the personal credentials of the person before we are going to be now in September, being able to uh, release it openly to the to the whole community. This has taken a lot of time. So if if, it, if instead of doing that, we have been able to really have other people working with us from the medical health science, they would have actually be able to come up with maybe other algorithms on those that we actually came up on our side. And we have saved roughly at least four to six months, which in a situation of pandemic, in this case, is actually pretty critical, I believe. Okay, I have a quick, we are out of time, but uh, we have a quick question uh, about uh, all the historical data in paper that could uh, illustrate connections in pathologies. Is there an initiative to pass this data from paper into a, uh, a digital format? Is, it, is there anything, Natasha? Yes, there is. There are many uh, people doing this text mining, basically digitizing these data. There is a huge push on that. Uh, I have whole colleagues everywhere do it, doing this. This is done now mainly by these embeddings or these uh, uh, sentences and finding meanings of them. Absolutely, I think this is key uh, uh, to include those data. But don't, not only that, I mean, from hospitals, you have, you know, uh, doctors uh, yeah. taking their yeah. notes. And what is the meaning yeah. of that? What is the semantics of that? This is a huge uh, 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 research area okay. in uh, NLP, natural language processing. Yeah. Okay, there is one more question, but it's a particular one. I will deal bilaterally with the person that asked the question. Yeah. So. Giovanni, I leave it for you. Okay, uh, okay then. So <clears throat> we have arrived at the end of the session. Uh, we can go home or whatever we want, knowing that computing centers will be more efficient and that we will be healed better. It is quite a good take home message to start the day with. And for this, I wish to thank also on behalf of Endica, the speakers for that very interesting presentation and the participants for their mm -hmm. lively contribution to the session. Uh, last but not least, of course, we also thank the organizer, the scientific and technical organizers of this event. And then we wish a beautiful day to all of you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.